Okay, I think I'm live. This is exciting. I haven't done this for ages. So, hello to everybody who will hopefully be joining me in a second. I am going live shortly with the children's dietitian, Lucy Upton, and I'm really, really excited about this live. Oh, there's people joining. Hi. Unless I've broken Instagram. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Hi. Hi, Lucy. How are you? I'm good. I'm so sorry. I hope you know this is going to sound like such first world problems, but I was like, oh my God, it's raining. I need my ring light. <laughs> it was suddenly really dark. You're so organized. I was like, it's really dark in here. I'll just roll with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was just like, I'm sure it's somewhere. I think it's in the car, which is so random, which also sounds really diva. <laughs> like I'm just caking everywhere. I don't know. I was just doing some filming at the weekend. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Good. Very well. Thank you. Very well. Enjoying all this fabulous weather. Yeah, it's lovely, isn't it? Thank yeah. you so much for coming on this live. I've just been saying to everyone that I get asked a lot of questions about celiac disease and children, but yeah. I don't have children. I have no knowledge of children in general, let alone when it comes to celiac. <laughs> Their so own world. I feel like I'm going to have a lot of questions for you, and we've got some great questions mm. that have come in. But I wondered if you wanted to start by just introducing yourself so everybody who doesn't know you will know who you are. Yes, I will. Um, so my name's Lucy. Hello, everyone. Um, I am a paediatric, so that just means children's dietitian. Um, I actually did my four-year degree at uni, had only ever worked with adults. They do lots of training, and I was like, I don't want to work with adults. And <laughs> so all I've done now for the last 11 years is work in paediatrics. I'm very lucky. Um, and I see children from the moment they're born um, all the way up until they're like 16, 18. So actually you have to get to grips with lots of different um, oh, age yeah. groups and, and nutritional needs at different stages. And, you know, I think often, you know, people think, oh, dealing with kids is just like mini adults and they're really not. <laughs> like, <laughs> there are so many nuances and so many things that are different. And actually I have to say, you know, nutrition, I think it gets so mixed up in the adult world because there's so much information out there and it's, it's, it's probably no different for kids as well. But I know that there's a lot of pressure on parents to always feel like they're getting it right. And so many things to navigate. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm really lucky. I, I really love my job. I, I work part time at the hospital for a big children's hospital. And then I work privately myself the rest of the time. Oh, brilliant. It sounds like you're really passionate about what you do as well. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's I'm really lucky. I think I'm, I'm sure I put it down to growing up just with an absolute love of food and interest in health. <laughs> and I didn't even know what a dietitian was. I remember mum saying to me once, you know, you could kind of combine this and be a dietitian. I was like, what? Uh, like, oh, can I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Well, we've had loads of really great questions wow. come in. Cool. So I thought if we just kind of start things right at the very beginning. Yeah. A lot of the questions I get from people, and we'll start off with this, is a lot of people have celiac disease, mm. then they have kids, and yeah. they're like, what the hell do I do regarding like celiac? Do I get yeah. them tested? Do I feed them gluten? So I think like... <laughs> I mean, it's where do we even start with that? <laughs> yeah, I suppose there's a couple of things we can cover from this point of view. So it, it is actually, you know, it's very pragmatic and sensible for, for anyone who's got kids and has a diagnosis of celiac disease themselves to be aware that their child is much more likely. You know, there is an increased risk of your child having celiac disease. Um, but, you know, we know that there's that genetic element. There are particular mm. genes that we find that are related to celiac disease and often, like many things that are inherited, are therefore carried through families. Yeah. But it isn't a sign seal delivered, this is going to happen. You know, I know children where there's no family history and that's been ruled out and they have celiac disease and, like and vice versa. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then vice versa, families where, you know, I've got families where both parents are celiac and actually wow. the child isn't. So um, a lot, I get a lot, I get asked a lot of advice, usually at that first stage, so the, you know, weaning mm. stage, what do I do with gluten? Do I put it in? And, and at the moment the advice is yes, from six months okay. of age, you, you do introduce it into your child's diet. You know, <laughs> I always like to tag that on with, and if you've got a celiac parent at home, please look after yourself whilst you do it. Because, yeah, because that must be a hard thing. Yeah. Children don't eat food neatly, they kind of throw food. <laughs> yeah, they're like, they want to feed you. Yeah, that must <laughs> they want to so do all hard. these things. Yeah, so I always just say, you know, you've got to then be really pragmatic again about being that, you know, if it's going to be in the house or if you have a gluten free house anyway and you are going mm -hmm. to introduce it to your baby, you know, 
keep yourself safe, keep it separate, you know, you know, it, where you're preparing things, cleaning things, all the usual sort of standard good practice that we would have about avoiding cross contamination. Yeah. But like next level, because food goes everywhere, like your baby yeah. will be covered in food. So and then I think, you know, and the other thing I say along that, the question I'll, I'll say, the question I get a lot is, well, does it matter if I give them some of my gluten free foods? You know, yeah. I'll be cooking pasta for all of us. I want to still have the same meal. Is it fine if I use this pasta? And yes, of course, absolutely. Okay. You know, those, that's absolutely fine if naturally, you know, the rest of the time or predominantly the rest of the time they are you know they're you know they're gluten-free and actually when kids yeah. go to nursery it can be quite helpful because sometimes it's like nurseries where those foods yeah. go in um particularly if they're there for a couple of meals a day and then at home yeah. we just keep it gluten-free so things sometimes ease up if, if children end up in childcare. um but yeah essentially i mean i think there's some really interesting studies still going on around like in the allergy arena okay. we looked a lot at like early introduction to allergens and how does that sort of look at preventing and there is work going on around sort of celiac disease too so it'd be interesting to see what that comes out with but for now yeah. no exclusion and i think the other thing to say is you will be hyper vigilant about if there are any yeah. signs or symptoms you will you know and th there might be at some point and you know a baby could present as as early as like six months of age, but equally I see kids who are absolutely fine for years and years and years, and then they might be four or six or eight, and that's when they start to see things going on. So yeah, often we won't test just willy nilly. We won't go fishing, we call yeah. it. Let's not go fish fishing for things unless we've got sort of evidence or understanding that we, we might need to be concerned. Okay, so what sort of things, because obviously there's so many symptoms to celiac disease, and there's a lot of symptoms that I guess like, you might only see or understand in adults things like brain fog or migraines like yeah. obviously a baby can't tell you that they've got brain fog nope. um so like what sort of things i know it's probably a very broad spe broad spectrum but like what yeah. sort of things should people be looking out for in their kids from like babies to toddlers to older yeah and i, I think the other thing is that lots some of the symptoms are, are really common in children too you know okay. so, so and, and this is where it becomes hard and you know if you are ever concerned it's important to go through someone who can take a really good history with you mm. um and you're right they can't say my tummy hurts my head hurts yeah. i feel awful um often you know the one thing i would say before i go into anything is is trusting parental instinct is really key you know, yeah. th there are so many parents who say to me, there's just, they're just, their demeanor isn't right. What, like, why are they irritable all the mm -hmm. time? You know, why is my baby or child the one who's always grouchy or clinging their belly or curling themselves up on the sofa? And, and I think, be, yeah. you know, be aware of those behavioral and mood changes, particularly if they sort of, they persist and they don't seem to alleviate and they perhaps don't follow those sort of like normal developmental milestones that we see, you know, like it's not really normal for toddlers to have these outbursts and tantrums, but actually potentially yeah. if you've got an older or a younger child who's perhaps doing things like that or got some sort of behaviors where you're like, Oh, this just does not seem right. Then trust your instinct. Um, and yeah. in kids, what we see a lot of is so often I'll see children with sort of quite chronic and persisting gut based symptoms. So that might be constipation, it might be diarrhea, it might be a mm -hmm. mix of both and waxing and waning between both of them. Um, you know, bloating, lots of wind, um, kind of really offensive, sometimes smelling stools. Um, but even, you know, mm -hmm. persistent vomiting, you know, really, you know, really significant. Sometimes it's not even vomiting, it's kind of the reflux side of things. Um, and then we see other things like, um, and actually I've got lots of children who incidentally get a diagnosis because they have a blood test for something else and, you know, mm -hmm. we get an iron result back and it's in its boots and we're like, oh, that's yeah. strange. And but, their okay. diet would suggest otherwise, you know, they're not consuming litres and litres of milk a day or anything. And you think, oh, that's yeah. really strange. Their diet's pretty good. I want to, and then you start prying and, that, you know, and so many parents go to me, oh yeah, well, I just thought that was normal. And everyone tells me that, you know, kids get constipated and yeah. they get this. And I think... You know, often it's a collection of symptoms that there's a few clues there, but sometimes it's not obvious. And, and as you know, it's it's notoriously underdiagnosed. You know, we know yeah. if it's affecting one in 100 people and only sort of around 30 percent of those are being diagnosed. Actually, that's lots of people out there who, you know, who aren't. So um, and in kids of weight loss and kind of we call it like food aversion, or maybe being off their yeah. food is, is, can be a really common one I see. So, so weight loss, obviously, because you know they're malabsorbing essentially they're really struggling to get all the nutrients they need and kids yeah. often drop quite noticeably because they don't yeah. have the reserves we do and you're like well they look skinny you know especially mm. if that hasn't been their build normally um yeah so it can be it can just be a whole collection of, of symptoms and i think again you know 
if you're worried always go and ask because and trust your mm -hmm. instincts especially if you know you know family history wise there'll be a lot of those parents who are very very aware yeah and obviously if you are a parent and you have celiac disease and your kid is not showing any kind of like symptoms or anything I mean, is it worth pushing to get them tested anyway? Or would you say that unless they're really showing anything wrong, you should just carry on as normal? Yeah, I think if we were going, you know, so there isn't really in place a kind of universal testing. Mm -hmm. We will, you know, some places do. I'm, I'm almost certain it's probably something now that you can get, you know, you can you can access privately. And can I find yeah. out if they're carrying that gene? But, you know, like I will always, like I kind of talk about across the spectrum of things. Cause actually, we say that there are lots of genes associated with lots of things in terms of health. Mm. it's it's those genes being there is one thing but then it's sort of then cascading into actually developing that if you have that predisposition yeah it sometimes needs a little nudge and you know and actually sometimes we, you know it's really interesting i've seen children where maybe that genetic predisposition there is there and it's been a viral illness or it's been something mm, okay. that sort of yeah it's really really interesting again probably needs lots more mm. studying but i think it's go ahead as you can for the time you know normally i don't think you would you yeah. probably won't get a referral for example to a gastroenterologist saying we've got a history can you test them yeah they probably won't i suppose that sort of makes sense mm -hmm. and then if if you are worried that your kid has symptoms and you yeah. go to the doctor yeah. for adults obviously the kind of guidance is you'd have a blood test then an endoscopy but i can imagine if you've got a small child you probably think oh my gosh that's so like that's a lot for a kid yeah. i mean yeah. is that still the pathway for kids to be diagnosed how does it sort of work largely so i mean with kids the one thing i would say is if your kid ever needs bloods phlebotomists are fabulous with children they've got right. lots of things they can do with their arms i'm always like can i have a go at this like freezing numbing <laughs> spray and stuff they don't give that to us adults no, but they, they are don't. very good at getting kids <laughs> they're very good at getting bloods from kids and are used to the wrigglers mm. and the you know, there's, there's all sorts yeah. of chatty people who will be like, look over here. Um, but so, yeah, normally, so what they would start off with was like, similarly to, very similarly to adults is they would start mm -hmm. with a blood test. And what, that blood test, what they're looking for are antibodies to tissue transglutamase, which is essentially an enzyme in the gut. Lots of big words there. And what they're looking to see is that en if, if, if the body is essentially attacking itself and attacking the enzyme yeah. in the gut that's what they're looking for so you would expect those antibodies to be raised mm. um, and what's really important for anybody who is going through that testing process is to understand that it's really important alongside that to have um iga tested too because lots of us well lots a good proportion of people can mm. also be iga deficient and so if okay. you go looking for those antibodies but you're iga deficient and they're iga antibodies we don't find them so you can get like a false negative right. so it's important that they they usually the, you know guidance would be conjunctively that they would do the two um and then in terms of diagnosis now things are getting a lot better then there's lots of research gone in celiac disease and actually generally if the results are high what will then happen is you'll get a referral to a pe you know a pediatrician usually a gastroenterologist who knows mm. lots about celiac disease um and then they usually decide what to do next so if for example child's iga deficient but they have got symptoms they would potentially yeah. do some other blood tests looking for different antibodies again trying to get a bit of a result rather than just go we'll just scope you yeah um if the results on the normal sort of um anti-ttg tests are high enough often considerably you know so three four whatever fold mm. higher increasingly they they may not scope and they may consider that okay. diagnostic enough for celiac disease particularly if they then um, do some additional blood tests and find that you have one of these common genes that's associated with mm -hmm. celiac disease the two together they'll go okay yeah we're quite confident and you're symptomatic so all of those sorts of things sort of come together um and then sometimes yes they do send you know they do send them for a scope mm. but it must do. be quite like reassuring for parents to know that actually the bloods can pick up quite a lot like now compared to where it's before yeah so you much better. Would have had to have an endoscopy, and that was that. <laughs> yeah, and and then there would be waits for endoscopy, and everyone's yeah. like, "Oh, oh, what do I do?" And, and and you know, it's never a nice thing. You know, I'm sure you can vouch for it. It's not particularly pleasant. I don't remember mine. I was under general <laughs> anaesthetic, so I don't remember any. Oh, <laughs> they're not the best they're not the no. best. They're little ones you know they and the thing i would say is if your child does end up having to go down you know if they did mm. end up having to go for something like that again they'll be in safe they'll be safe good hands those doctors know exactly what they're doing they know exactly what they're looking for and they should you know i don't see too many children traumatized for too no. long afterwards especially i have to say they are remarkably resilient children more so than <laughs> we would ever give them credit for <laughs> I feel like an adult would probably be more nervous going into that than a child because a child's just like, oh, it's just another 
thing and then crack on afterwards. Yeah, I've never like, got oh, God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pediatric hospitals are great as well. And the other thing to just say in terms of diagnosis, I know what lots of people do when they suspect something is up, so from a food perspective and gluten gets thrown in the mix, and we we'll probably talk a bit more about that. So mm. take it out. Yeah, and I just know it's so <laughs> important that it is in. And it's, it's yeah. awful. I actually had this conversation with a mum the other day because actually Anna, yeah. I think we just accidentally stumbled across something. She was like, oh, I took this out and all of a sudden this is completely gone. And I was like, mm. okay. <laughs> And, you know, there'd never been any other red flags, so it hadn't been anything on my radar. And I was like, actually, I think what we need to do now is get this. And you feel awful, even as a health professional going, I know it makes yeah. your child miserable, but can we, we need it back in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And how much do they have to eat, sort of roughly? It, it needs to be a good, this is the other thing with children, isn't yeah. it? So we would say usually at least, you know, a good portion of a gluten-containing food at least yeah. once a day. Um kids will not eat necessarily the same as adults. So it's much yeah. harder to be like two slices of bread. Because, and this is the other thing, you can go with the best intention and then that day they go, yeah, I'm not having that. So and for that reason, lots of my families go, actually, do you know what? We do try and give, you know, some wheat containing cereal at breakfast and mm -hmm. then some other, at least two, two meals to try and yeah. you know make sure that we've got that in, but kind of whatever works. Um, and, and not the other thing I would say is like not forcing it. You know, yeah. it, it, it's it, you, what you don't want on the route to diagnosis is suddenly a child who really dislikes meal times because you're like, I have mm. to get it back in. And they might be like, oh, I think I'm starting to realize that doesn't make me feel very good, you know? And, and we see that yeah. sometimes. It's interesting. Again, lots of parents say to me, so strange because, you know, even, you know, from this age onwards, they always seem to steer clear of these foods. And you're like, yeah. oh, it's, you know, they're naturally quite intuitive children as well. You know, they, they kind of do know what makes them feel good and not so good. It is funny because I was diagnosed, I think, when I was about 12. And mm. I remember by that point, I didn't like bread. I didn't like cakes. I didn't yeah. want to eat any of it. And no. obviously now I'm like, it's like I knew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even though we didn't know what it was at the time. It's, I think no. your body is quite intuitive. I absolutely, I always have a red flag of parents going, they really just don't like these foods. Yeah, you kind of delve like, mm. a little bit more into what's going on. Yeah. Definitely. And are you seeing more children nowadays sort of come into you? Obviously, you've worked with kids for quite a while now. Mm. Are you seeing more cases of celiac or is it being picked up more, would you say? I would say that our diagnostic processes are better. And I would say, mm. that, you know, again, to use big medical word, I think more and more people are aware of a potential different, you know, differential diagnosis. So when a child yeah. comes to you presenting with symptoms, this connection of symptoms or concerns, often it's our job or a medical team's job or to, to look and go it could be this or it could be this or it could be this you know i do this a lot is this delayed type allergy is this celiac disease is this um you know toddler diarrhea is it you know is it mm. chronic constipation w what is this it could be a multitude of things and actually i know it frustrates parents a lot actually when you end up having to go through actually we, we, we're kind of gonna have to work through this methodically let's rule yeah. that out let's rule that out let's do that and let's do that but um i certainly think it's being picked up a lot better i would say numbers in our services almost certainly are increasing at least okay. yeah so that's a good, I hope it's a good sign, although I know for a yeah. lot of people, you know, it's, it's a big life-changing diagnosis, a big life change for families. Parents suddenly feel very mm -hmm. overwhelmed and very, oh my gosh, what do I do now? Yeah, I mean, we've just had a comment, actually. I've just seen, I mean, just scroll through all these and find it. Um, somebody said, my 20-month-old is already a fussy eater and has just been diagnosed with celiac disease now, so it's even harder to find food that she likes. Yeah. Are there any tips on getting her to try more foods? I mean, that age group is a, is a fun age anyway. For yeah. Food. Yeah, so like two-year-olds are naturally, um, they go through a phase, and it's a very typical sort of stage of development for a lot of children where they are, much more selective about what they're going to be having. They're a little bit more hypervigilant about food. This massive throwback to when children are, um, I'm Mr. Independent, Mrs. Independent, now off I, you know, off I go, I'm going to go. And, but, yeah. but equally, you don't want them eating the bad berries off the bushes and, and, and helping themselves, so, and, and, you know, or battery. You know, we don't want everything in. So no. they, they tend to kind of, a lot of children fall into sort of habits around wanting predictable foods, wanting them to look the same every time, feed the same every time. You know, one minute it's their favourite, the next minute it's not. So... And and actually a transition with a lot of the products that are gluten free is a transition because actually mm. the bread, you might think it looks the same, but we know, you know, the taste is different. The texture yeah. is different. The way it feels in your mouth is different. And essentially what I say to a lot of parents is they've kind of got to relearn their confidence with those foods and relearn to eat mm. a lot of those foods um, too. And like we've just said, if there've been foods that might've been making them feel really unwell, they might just be like, nah, I know that yeah that looks like what <laughs> didn't make me feel good so all I would say is take the pressure off 
lots of lots of exposure where you can you know and i'm sure we'll talk about this like eating yeah. together is really important trying to have the same meals from an inclusivity point of view too you know children yeah. often don't do well as you know especially at this age but even going forward with oh we're all going to have this but you've got that and yes yeah. it happens sometimes but you know as a rule of thumb i'm like if you can try and eat some of the same foods together um starting with really small amounts not like here's like a triple decker gluten-free sandwich yeah. we go you know Enjoy. like really snappy go please and we're going that would look amazing so starting <laughs> really really small you know small amounts low level getting them and they will they'll smell it they'll touch it they'll feel it a bit will go in a yeah. bit will go out and, and children will relearn about food I always talk about food as a you know we forget that it is a learning mm. thing and it is skill driven and it is experience and exposure driven too so if it's new a little bit like when that person on holiday presents and they go look at our delicacy in your life yeah what's mm. that yeah no, no, just give this a little prod first and maybe a smell you very rarely like delve straight in do you yeah you go through that process of exploring and learning about food so pressure off you know mm. lots of exposure lots of positive role modeling no force feeding nice and relaxed and and over time you'll usually find that they will transition towards expanding their dietary range yeah because i think a lot of the comments people have been saying is that they're really worried about that child feeling like they're missing out so like you know they're all eating something or they're going out for dinner and that kid's like oh great i've got salad again yay lucky me um it's chicken and chips oh god yeah. <laughs> yeah it's always the same sort of thing and it's like are there any sort of tips i mean obviously you mentioned about eating together and i remember my mum being amazing and cooking like pasta but she'd do me my own separate pasta but we all have the yeah. same sauce the same so sauce like, yeah. yeah yeah i mean have you got any sort of other tips like that that might help maybe perhaps if we start with kind of like family meals perhaps so family meals for sure you know and i say to a lot of parents expect now that this is a transition for you as a family yeah. not just the child and i think that's an important from an inclusivity point of view and i'm going to keep banging on about this world but working with children with allergies and working with children with celiac disease and, and who have to make dietary modifications for health reasons not because they're choosing to yeah. not it's not choice you know but because they actually need to is a big sort of adjustment period so yeah. i would say go easy on yourself you don't need to be making like three course gourmet gluten-free meals to begin with start with some really simple transitions so go okay mm. right well let's first of all look i think it'd be really helpful to look at what are all the foods that are gluten-free anyway what can we yeah. all have and we would all have anyway because there's loads you know all your fresh fruits and veg your yeah. meat your fish your beans your pulses those sorts of things and get to grips with the basics and then often i sort of talk about gradually thinking about what substitutions you might make okay well, we're going to do pasta you know i've labeled red everything i know i know if i'm using any jarred sauces which ones we can have now and we'll all have those exactly we'll all have the same yeah. and we'll do some normal pasta and some gluten-free pasta and 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 exactly like you say or we'll yeah. do you know um we'll do sandwiches and we'll do exactly the same fillings everything else is the same you know other than you know using separate butters and things like that yeah. um but we're having the same and i think bringing those to meal times and also you know to some extent you will have to model for your child you know they will probably know the difference with some of it and if you sit there and all have the same whenever you can they'll go okay this is the same we're all having yeah. this they might be more you know they might be more likely to try it. but it is this transitionary period and i say it's just don't overwhelm yourself you know you i'm sure you can vouch for the more experience you get much more proficient you feel much more confident oh, you feel exactly. in in those and even cooking foods that you might not have had to cook before yeah. like what a learning curve i keep talking about pasta but what a learning curve cooking, <laughs> cooking gluten-free pasta oh, is God, i remember yeah. the first time i did it when i was about 18 and i was like oh my god what did i do wrong it, it, was it went to sludge sludge like, oh <laughs> yeah oh i can't use this and, and you gradually refine it you're like right okay don't take my yeah. eyes off that no and you'll, you'll know yeah. exactly when to take it off um i think it helps nowadays you know i have to say from when even when i started you know over 10 years ago to where we are now there are so many more products that are suitable oh, and gosh, yeah. there are so many more products that are palatable <laughs> as yeah. well um <laughs> And therefore much much you know much many more ways of being inclusive what i do appreciate is that a lot of those foods are also quite expensive yeah That's probably a side note so get to grips with what you can all have all of the time that can be staples in your store cupboard in your kitchen in your freezer yeah. um you know take some of the pressure off with things like batch cooking where you can and having easy thing you know your go-to's to hand your extras that you go along yeah. with eating out's a fun one um because yeah. i know yeah and you know i talked to a lot of families about 
and de you know depending on where they are on the journey they've had and lots of children you know lots of parents have quite an unwell child on the way there it's you suddenly try you put your yeah. responsibility in somebody else don't you yeah and that's like i mean it's hard enough doing it for yourself but i can imagine doing it with your child you're like please don't hurt my baby like yeah. oh God. <laughs> please i'm not being in you know and i have to you know so many yeah. parents like apologize to me for being like oh, I'm a helicopter parent, or I'm, I'm this, oh, I'm that. I'm like, no, you're not. Like, you're just, you know, you're advocating for your child when often they can't advocate for themselves. Exactly. So, you know, celiac, I, I can't believe I haven't even mentioned it yet, but Celiac Disease UK, they are amazing. Like, their oh, yeah. resources are extensive. And they, took, you know, they often, when we talk about when reaching out, I'm like, start again with somewhere that often has kind of a little bit of their stamp of approval, somewhere yeah. lots of people have tried and had positive experiences with you know, perhaps before you start venturing to some of the independence or things like that. Mm -hmm. I know loads of families who actually, when they get talking to places that offer gluten free, it's because one of the family members is, you know, actually, you know, yeah. talk and ask and don't be afraid to sort of vocalize it a lot of the time as well. And, you know, no one, and, and be really clear about what it is, because the other thing I would say is how people perceive the severity of what's going on because lots of people choose perhaps to mm -hmm. take gluten out of their diet or they choose to take things out for, and it might be IBS related, it might be for what's perceived health reasons, but actually explaining this is for a good medical reason and they really can't have and, you know, and the cost contamination yeah. is important. And can you tell me how you, you know, a, a, a good establishment should be able to tell you what, Definitely. You know, how they prepare their food. Yeah, like with, like you said, with CNET UK, they've got, I think it's over 300 venues that are accredited by them. Yeah. Um, and they've got like an app, I think, where you can search for them. So like, yeah. obviously, if you're going on holiday and you're not sure what's around, like, yeah. definitely the best place to start because at least you know they have all the kind of procedures in place because obviously cross-contamination is another thing you've got to think about. <laughs> yeah, and this is what I mean, it's putting that trust. And I think it's going back to that like thing that really irritates me when parents tell me that people or all places have said to them, a little bit won't hurt. And you know, when you're like, oh, oh but it will. I'm angry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh but, oh but it will and actually you know some of that comes down just to education doesn't it that is is, yeah. is lacking and there probably needs to be a huge amount more education in sort of catering and hospitality industries mm. and and that, not that you know sometimes that is the kitchen might have all had it but actually the front of staff might not and you yeah. know but this is what i mean just always communicate have something you can share that you know again see that you can have some great sort of resources that you can share when you go out that you can yeah. share with schools that you can share with friends and family and i know it suddenly feels like you as a parent have to suddenly become an expert very quickly to educate others but i actually you know i talk a lot about you don't need to know everything straight away signpost people to the same places you're getting information yeah. to exactly and i think that's a really good thing and you know if you're the first parent to go into that restaurant and say all that stuff then it might be easier for the next parent that does it as well a hundred percent a hundred percent you know and chat there's so many like online forums and really helpful yeah. you know groups and places now where people can share their experiences and and i you know i can't promise anything because i know everybody's journey is a little bit different and a lot of people really do struggle but actually my general experience from feedback with families is it gets better and easier if it can get easier with time. You know, it becomes Definitely. more of the norm for you. You, you. you know, you know the lines you use, you know what you do, you know how you prepare for if there isn't something there that they can have. And I always say that, you know, and maybe that's because I'm a massive planner, but I'm always like, just have something yeah. in your bag. You know, even if it's just something that can be an addition to a meal, if you can oh, get okay. some, you know, some meat and some fish and some veg or you salad, you know, whatever it is, just have something so that you can add it um yeah and, and be prepared always i don't go anywhere without snacks now no. i just i can't <laughs> no no and we all we all take snacks with us to lots of places anyway yeah. so i'm always just like just load your bag up you know and exactly <laughs> absolutely have something there and actually sometimes it's a good thing for a child you know if i put my feeding therapist mm. out for a minute i go actually if they're going somewhere new and then lots of kids will not be used to eating out particularly once you've been out for the last yeah. 18 months it'll be like oh what's going on here yeah. actually have something familiar <laughs> might be a bit of a oh, okay yeah. cool this is meal time i understand i see that i understand what's going on here you know so but one step at a time i know i know it's huge for so many parents to get on you know yeah. huge 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 yeah it's like you don't have to feel like you have to cook all the family meals and go out for dinner and do all this stuff in one go like you know get oh. used to one thing first <laughs> one thing at a time absolutely one thing at a time because yeah it will keep coming at you bit by bit and you'll go, oh, mm. I've got to navigate this for the first time. First kids party, first trip outside yeah. um, to a restaurant, first picnic, first holiday, you know, you know, first experience. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to be neggy Nancy at all, but there is probably going to be a point for a lot of families when they suddenly have to, you know, 
there might be slip ups, there might be yeah, misinformation, you know, and, and it's really hard then not to berate yourself for not anticipating those things. It, it's, mm. It is sometimes part of the process and it's, it's hard. And then as your kids get older, you have to relinquish some of the control and trust that they've got yeah. the knowledge and the skills. Do you remember mm. that? Um, like, I, do you remember that sort of transition? Yeah, so weirdly, like, I had a bit of, I mean, I had a bit of a rebellious phase, and I think that all teenagers will do it, like, where you suddenly, you can eat what you want. I was at uni, and I was like, oh, I'm not going to check that. I'm not going to, like, I'm going to have a Chinese. And honestly, I yeah. felt so rough for years. Yeah. And now I'm like, why did I do that? What's wrong with me? Yeah. But I think it's a phase that all kids probably go through, and I guess all you can do as a parent is just, be like well you know this is your health like try be careful yeah. i was gonna say it, it, it's educating at the right level you know and, and using yeah. those i talk a lot in with what i do about how do you start lots of parents ask me how do i help my child understand mm. what's going on and why rather than go no you can't have that and you're different child, yeah. you and understand why so you know with some of the younger kids there's some really wonderful books that you can get out there now oh, cool. that talk why can't i think what her name is it's like cecilia's celiac disease or something there's a little one that's, that's got brilliant. um crocodiles on it so that'd be much younger you know oh, that's cool. younger children and this is a sort of middle ground there's a, there's some really nice books and and like stories that kind of help you know help kids understand i've got mm. a comic book even now i still give out a little bit and and places and websites and things that and, and starting to get them involved in things you know often i say when kids might not be able to understand food all the food labels and and all that reading you know might not be really until they're you know sort of primary school but about to leave yeah. you know it's, it's really hard you know okay take take your food maestro app out or something and get them to scan with the smiley faces and yeah. some cues start to come early and they're like okay hold on i'm starting to understand some of this oh, but it yeah. is it's an education and a health professional should help you with that just to say you don't yeah. have to, that's the other thing you know yeah. Good luck. <laughs> like people like me should be able to sit and, and we we know how to talk to kids of different ages and help them understand and, and ask and mm -hmm. teach and, and that's the role of health professional too and I think when you're a teenager as well it's that really hard stage of like you don't want to be the one who stands out you want to fit in or your friends oh, are going God. to go for pizza you want to go out as well I mean what do you have any kind of like quick bar tips to kind of deal with that sort of situation of wanting to kind of just fit in yeah i think that's a really emotionally i think it's such a tough mm. phase for so many you know kids and as you say teenagers when exactly that you don't want to be any different and you want to go and be able to have all of these things yeah. and um educate you know i'm a big advocate of educating and talking early to friends and and mm. you know support trying to support and empower you you know your kids to feel confident that it isn't not a defining feature for them, but it is part of how they live and yeah. that's okay. And therefore, you know, a little bit of forward planning can be helpful. So if you know that they're going out, oh, cool. Well, do you know, have you guys thought about where you're going to eat? Okay, well, actually this place is really good for me because, yeah, you know, and saying, or, or offering options and kind of, it, again, it's, it's not as easy as being spontaneous, is it? When you're like, no. oh, we're just going to go here now on the way home. But actually, you know, having some options and some go-tos and some, and some lines, you know, potentially for some of the older kids that they, where they can, you know, that they can use. And as you say that, go guys, no, this is just, this is, this is part of my health. It's something that I have to do. Um, do you mind if, or can we go here? Or I'm going to go here. You're more than welcome to come with me, mm. but it is, it is, tr it is a tricky phase. And I think like many things, communication, really important with anybody yeah. who's in that circle of friends and helping them to understand. The second is about, you know, kind of also without putting my psychology hat on, really feeling the feelings and the emotions. There are going to be times where yeah. kids need it to sit down and acknowledge and go, yeah, this is crap, isn't it? This is, this is difficult, yeah. isn't it? You know, tell me how you're feeling and you don't have to be ashamed of feeling rubbish or feeling, you know, having those feelings of being left out or frustrated and actually kind of looking at taking that in and reframing it where you can. I mean, again, I would say, I feel like it's becoming easier. It's certainly not mm. plain sailing, but it's becoming easier because it is better. It's more, there is more awareness, not necessarily always in the right sort of yeah. frame. Not, it's not always because, oh, it's because we've got rising numbers of people with celiac disease. It's because mm. we've got rising numbers of people who want to be gluten free. But either way, you know, if the more people communicate, communicate it openly and honestly, the more people, every time somebody picks something up and starts to understand them more, that will just, you know, that will benefit others. Yeah. And I think you can spin a positive on it. Like I think mm. 
for me, like being a teenager, my friends kind of found it a bit novel and it was exciting. Like, oh, can we find somewhere Sarah can eat? Or, oh, look, yeah. there's some food you can eat. And I think it's almost turning it into a, a positive thing. And like, you yeah. know, if your friends are really friends and they will want to do that for absolutely. you and they'll get behind you. Absolutely, absolutely. And also, you know, just, uh, I, again, I was, this is how I reframe a lot of my allergy stuff as well. Mm. And, and same with celiac diseases it's straight away, it's easy to default to, well, I can't have any of these things. Yeah. And actually, it's, it's good to go, look, here's all the stuff I can have, and here's all the places I can eat. Exactly. And kind of focus back in on those positives and go, it doesn't make it unobtainable then. It's like, well, we, it's not, we can't invite them out for dinner because there's nothing they can have. Actually, there's tons of places we can go. Do you mind if we pick somewhere from here to start off with? Or do yeah. you mind if, you know, can you let me know so I can ring ahead and just check? And I think the more that people sort of, and, and kids get in that mindset and repeat and share with their friends, the more that those, as I say, will be in people's thoughts. And next time it might be that their friends go, well, let's just, let's go here because we know that you can go there. And then it's then becomes a complete non-issue, doesn't it? But I appreciate exactly. it might not be that smooth sailing. No, <laughs> not always, but hopefully like if you get the right group. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, someone's just asked a question actually, which kind of leads me on to something I wanted to talk about. Um, so they said a problem we have is friends and family will buy my son gluten-free treats and he's also type 1 diabetic so the treats do no favors for blood sugars and I've been asked a couple of questions about the fact that there's quite a lot of sugar in free from products I mean is there kind of any general advice because I guess when you give up gluten the default is to just go right I need to go buy everything in the free from aisle and before you know it you've got a house full of gluten-free cakes and biscuits and that's it and not a yeah. vegetable in sight I mean yeah. what would your sort of thoughts beyond that <laughs> yeah it's interesting isn't it so so i would always be i would always be about balance and i was all you know i would always say that you know food can have a level playing field and these sometimes foods can be incorporated i completely appreciate that actually um and it's interesting you mentioned um that your son just checking here sorry um is type one because we know that there is that also that link with celiac disease and yeah. other sort of autoimmune conditions so with things like um you know thyroid issues or diabetes yeah. and yet yeah, absolutely a massive balance or lots of things added i've got you know i've got lots of kids and they go oh my child's you know they're celiac disease but also egg allergic and there's egg whiting yeah. loads of breads you know and so it is it's a constant <laughs> education and a constant minefield so um, what I would say is, is absolutely there can be a place for those foods. Um, there can be a place for those foods as part of a balanced diet. But again, again, it comes down to probably to the education, the communication and going, if we're going to have these foods, we would probably want children to be having them in the same frequency we would recommend for children normally, which is yeah. not an everyday food, which is a, <laughs> I call them the sometimes foods, you know, and mm. when we do it, we all do it and we all enjoy having it. And we might have a little bit of gluten-free brownie with some, you know, some strawberries and some yogurt and we include it as part mm of a kind of balanced meal. And so from a blood sugar control perspective as well, that might, you know, having as part of a meal might also be sort of a beneficial thing. And the other thing again, just comes down to education and going, actually there are some other things that are gluten free that they can have as a healthy snack too. You know, there's yeah. different things based on nuts and seeds or gluten-free grains or different fruits and dried fruit and, you know, popcorn and, and you ho make a homemade trail mix or do, do some yeah. making and, and education together. I, but I appreciate that, again, families, it, it is really, really difficult. And I think sometimes there's some overcompensatory behaviors, I have to say, where mm. there's this thing where people go, oh my gosh, is it awful that they can't have all these things? So we'll, we'll ship in. We'll give them all you the know? And we'll give them all and yeah just as as be pragmatic as part of a balanced you know a really really we really, sorry that's me going i'm back yeah. oh. oh gosh Matt is going, battery, battery. I'm back. <laughs> no it's all right i've got, I've got at least 20 percent of my battery we've got another oh, 20 right. minutes that's fine that's me <laughs> being out all day not plugging it back in oh, um no. <laughs> these damn batteries don't last long do they um they <laughs> and yeah and obviously you know from a, a you know from a diabetes point of view, that's sort of managing that as part of a balanced diet. It's it's modifying, you know, insulin as you need to if they're yeah. carb counting and all of those sorts of things. But I think the frequency of having those foods is something that doesn't, you know, doesn't have to come up to a question. If there's sometimes foods that doesn't need to be something that's given every day anyway, and in which case that should help, you know, help support sort of blood sugar regulation and managing the diabetes side of things too. But yeah, and education education talking communication i will always yeah. be a, just this huge advocate of like we need to talk about it you know don't shy away from having those conversations because they've done something nice acknowledge it go yeah oh my gosh do you know we're so appreciative that you've gone out and got all of these mm. things we have to be careful because do you mind if we have you know next time maybe should we just buy one or should we buy this one and la 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 yeah i think it's hard because people do want to like like you said they want to overcompensate and you know 
sometimes it's difficult but at least you can freeze a lot of gluten-free cakes so if you do get you those can. Cakes, just come in the freezer and then you can kind of ration them out <laughs> yeah or do some baking like there's, there's ways yeah. of kind of creating lower sugar versions and things you know when you and you can add in things like you know almond ground almonds if your kids can have nuts and there's there's ways of going sort of lower added sugar foods that you might make yourself yeah um, and you can get them involved from that perspective but and too far then you know kid gets experience with learning about foods that they can have and baking and food exposure and you know you again alongside no kind of what's in that no no how much sugar or sugar containing foods have gone in and those sorts of things definitely one last question i wanted to ask you because mm. i conscious your battery's gonna die soon no it's all right <laughs> I, I will, I it will tell me when there's 10 percent, and then we'll talk okay. really fast <laughs> Um, I've been asked a few questions about like whether there's certain supplements or vitamins that kids should have when they stop eating gluten or are there any sort of like things you might need to compensate for in the diet when they go gluten free? Yeah, so I get this I get this question a lot too because if, right. as soon as you remove something from someone's diet, everyone's like, wow, ah, I've got to supplement with something. Um, so we, you do have to be more conscious of certain things. Often there are certain nutrients that I think, and, and as part of our annual review, you know, we do take a really good look at. So we might look at things like iron and things like B12 and folate and fiber and calcium. Um, mm. And actually in adults, we know that um, requirements for certain nutrients like calcium are much higher than the general population. So they'd be like a thousand milligrams for an adult compared to, you know, more like 800 or less or 750. So for example, um, but with kids, we just say what we're aiming for is that they get those foods as part of a balanced diet and they get those nutrients from foods and really if the celiac disease is under control and therefore you know that the gut is healed all of those villi are nice and back at the bottom of you know in your intestine yeah. and therefore you can absorb the nutrients from foods better then theoretically you shouldn't need to supplement with lots of additional vitamins and minerals i will caveat that with um all children kind of kind of from weaning age um, up until they go to school, we recommend vitamin A, C and D supplement. That's sort of general NHS recommendations for that supplementation. Unless a baby's still on sort of 500 mils of formula or more a day where they, they don't need it because it's in the formula milk. Yeah. Um, and I have to say, I'm still a huge advocate of giving vitamin D during the winter months for children beyond that point anyway. You know, we're not notoriously very good at getting a lot of sunshine. No. <laughs> it is very important. It has an important role in the immune system. It has an important role in um, bone health and all those sorts of things so actually vitamin d yes and actually that's kind of the role of a dietitian too is actually if they if they yeah. look at your child's diet and they assess anything and they go actually are we really struggling you know we're we struggling to get enough iron or we're we struggling to get enough of this they'll say if you think that you need some additional vitamin or mineral supplementation but first line really should you know always be diet which is why we think about you know balancing out those iron rich foods making sure we're getting other sources of fiber you know fruits vegetables suitable nuts and seeds and different grains and things like that so that mm -hmm. you don't you know because i think sometimes that also empowers a choice with understanding managing a gluten-free diet too yeah yeah definitely so if anyone like is obviously going through this now and they're sort of about to go through like the diagnosis stage is yeah. it then sort of automatic that they will be referred to a dietitian once they have a celiac diagnosis is that the sort they of pathway should. yeah most people should so, yeah and you can certainly it's, it's definitely part of best practice so if you haven't seen one or you're not having regular mm. reviews please ask for one because yeah. there's lots of us out there who are quite happy to help you know we have as an example, our um, our pathway kind of looks at children when they first get diagnosed. We put them through sort of a parents or an education program. They also meet other parents of children with celiac disease. The kids oh, cool. meet the kids. We do like group program. Obviously, it's been very remote. <laughs> yeah, last even year. so, that must be so yeah. helpful. Yeah, um, and then we kind of put them in for um, reviews, and that might be initially. Sometimes that might be every six months as you're getting established with diagnosis. We're checking that you know. Um, things are being managed well that ttg is coming down and coming back to normal levels and sort of diet health growth all of those sorts of things are going in the right direction yeah um, and then it could be quite normal to kind of have an annual review where all of those things are picked upon um and people often say oh i just you feel, really feel like i've got this now we kind of feel like i need you less you know whereas okay. in the first instance it feels like you might need a lot more guidance and support. yeah so yeah absolutely you can get plenty and plenty of support from a dietitian Oh, brilliant. Well, I think that's kind of wrapped up most of the questions we've had. Unless I have a quick else, look. Anything else you wanted to cover? I know I would... someone's asked us about um, being tested, and we've kind of covered that. We've covered that earlier, yeah. yeah. Some people do. I think they've yeah. said that they're going to send them testing. Some people do, but the thing is, 
the other thing I would say about that, with, you know, with caution is, you, you could send your child for testing because you've got a history of celiac disease in your family, it could come back negative. Mm. That doesn't mean that in a year's time, yeah, you see what, you know, it, it, that's not, it. so this is why I always sort of think we do it when we have any sort of alarm bells and some people may choose to do it yeah. um, sooner. Um, talking about think people being sketchy, so he even thought, oh, yeah. I've just seen uh, someone has also asked about what the apps were called. So ooh. Celiac UK, if you join yeah. Celiac UK, they've got the food scanner app and yeah. the ven it's like a venue eating out. If you search for it online, you'll find them. Yeah, um, absolutely. That, um, there's one called Spoon Guru. That's a lot more kind of, I think okay. it used to be US based and Food Maestro and, and Food Maestro covers other food allergens too. So you can say oh, Celiac, but you can also cut out like you know, I've got kids that have to cut out gluten and potentially milk and egg and a variety right. of other things. And you know, that becomes added layers. So that oh, stands for helpful. all of those, those foods as well. So if you've got a child with multiple kind of, if you've got celiac disease and or multiple food allergies, that's a really, really good one. Oh, brilliant. Um, yeah, I didn't know about that. A few people saying, obviously, families, people having the same, absolutely. Like that's, that's what a lot of families do. They go, we're just a gluten free house now. And that's, and that's how we, you know, and that's how we manage things. Whereas others go actually we choose to do these but we know how to do it and how to do it you know mm -hmm. and how to do it safely so um interesting someone said it's definitely overcompensatory yes yes yeah, everything gluten-free comes in multi-pack yes like, it does it comes in packs. four and six doesn't it it does yeah yeah and when everyone's buying you that you're like i have a lot of cake <laughs> yeah like okay i've got i've got loads of these and exactly that you know whereas a pack of six cakes might normally be spread between you know, four to six people, for example, that then pack of four or six with one person, it, it, the tendency is then, you know, and that's probably what I should have said from a diabetes perspective as well, is that actually yeah. the frequency of those food, but the portion size at the time is also going to be really, you know, really, really important. And as you yeah. say, freeze them, save them, you know, get or eat them yourself. Them. <laughs> or eat them yourself. I was going to say, or share them and accept that you're all yeah. going to have, them, you know, all going to have the gluten-free cakes. But, and I suppose the only other thing I would say is that, you know, for lots of kids and families this can you know really be a challenge it can really take a toll on sort of stress levels and, and mental health and things like that and again that's something not to kind of ignore um and yeah. if it's something that you're finding challenging do you make sure that you reach out for some support and you don't kind of do it on your own because you know like many things of managing a chronic and for your child lifelong mm -hmm. now condition yeah it's it, it's it's not this oh well that's fine and off we go easy breezy i think it's, it's important to kind of think as a parent you know lots of people will feel i have so many parents who say to me I feel so guilty that i've missed this for so long i didn't mm. realize you know and actually all of those are really there's lots of emotions that can come with the point of diagnosis and then the what next so just yeah. that's what health professionals are here for you know psychology all those sorts of things are really really important and thinking about yourself and your child quite, quite holistically because as you say mm. like any dietary change affects every day it affects every meal you can't really get a day off from it can you you can't be like yeah. we're not going to worry about that exactly. today we don't need to eat today like you kind of do need to eat today yeah. you need to think about it and therefore it's often it's kind of at the forefront of a lot of people's minds all the time um i suppose the only thing we haven't talked about and one thing i was but lots of people ask me about school yes what yeah. do we do about school and, what should, and how should school how should school help accommodate for um yeah. and the thing is they should they should like okay. any other health condition which it is you know yeah. yes they should they should be accommodating um catering teams you know lots of children get like free school meals and things like that they yeah. should be able to go through menus with you identify foods that are going to be suitable what alternatives they can have on days when there are not for example suitable foods yeah. hopefully not just jacket potato every day and i think you know it is fair to say <laughs> I've got so I still to this day I have still so many families where they go that's that's just what that is plated foiled up separately mm. and I know that's a huge frustration because that's that's not fair mm, you know it's, it's not fair and it's also not appropriate and there are so many other things that can be mm. offered appropriately but again often that's that coming back to communicate with school ask what help catering needs see the UK yeah. have a great catering pack for school um and they can get involved if your kids do cooking and stuff at school like home yeah. back in my day like you can you can absolutely uh, yes absolutely they can still do those things but again it's just thinking pragmatically about where you know where are they preparing what are they preparing is all mm. of that gluten-free or their alternatives is everything clean not using the same oil to fry things oven you know making sure the oven's clean it, mm. all of the kind of stuff that will become as you can show us sorry as you can vouch for like day to day it becomes so, habit it, it becomes does a lot easier <laughs> it does it does but yeah so definitely anybody reach out if you need some support not on your own there are lots of children mm. and lots of families out there sort of managing gluten-free so yeah, you're not alone in it, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, not at all, not at all.
Oh, brilliant. Lucy, this has been great. If people want to find you to kind of find out a bit more about what you do and you post some amazing stuff like generally on Instagram, like where can people find you? Not literally, uh, but on the Literally internet. where can they find My front room with my ring yeah, lights. With my fancy ring lights. <laughs>